clearly your execution of your role has been at such a level of success that it led to you know, HBO and powers that be in Hollywood to model a character after you in a in a show, in a series. So talk about how that all came to be and a little bit about the Colleen character on camera. Oh, that was a crazy adventure. I had never had anything to do with TV or film or I, I knew nothing about that process, uh, even in college studying communications. I think that might have been, you know, maybe an intro class where they mentioned those things that I never... I never really had anything to do with it. And a friend of mine, uh, one of the things about Silicon Valley as a TV show, and the reason it's, I think it's so funny is because it is so real that they use uh, all of these people who are in these jobs and in these roles, um, and they actually bring them into the writer's room. And a friend of mine had been brought in as a full-time writer, content person, producer, uh, who had been somebody I had hired early in his career right out of college and then had stayed in touch with. And then he had become a venture capitalist, which meant that he was funding companies. So he was seeing a lot of startups. And for this last season, they were going to really go in on this is a real company now and what happens. And they, I guess they, you know, they had said like, hey, we're going to need an HR person. Do you know anybody who does that? And he's like, I know exactly the person who does that. And so you know, he reached out and um, and asked I'd be interested, and and I said, yeah, sure, sounds you know, sound, having no idea what it would be like, but um, uh, and you know, I got a very small check. It was very funny how they uh, sort of pay you, and you get your name in the credits, and that's kind of fun. And I was just like, yeah, sure, it'd be super fun. I didn't realize that they were building a character around me. That was the one nuance that did not come out until much later. Uh, but I spent you know, four hours with 20 writers at the very beginning, just they were asking me all these questions. How do things work? What are some crazy things? And I had lived through crazy startups. So that show to me actually used to be painful. Like I would watch it and just be like, oh my God, something I've done is going to end up on here. Uh, and like one of my former CEOs had been on the show and helping at one point. And so I was like, oh, this is not going to go. This is this crazy. So it was kind of leaning into a fear um in one way and they just asked me all sorts of crazy fun things that had happened and then as they were writing the season i'd get these like random emails where they'd send me pages of script and say is this right is this how it would happen is this what they would say is this you know what's the language you would use for this or we have this scenario you know how would what would you do with those two employees those kinds of things so um, I, I didn't actually know what they were going to do with all of it until the show actually aired uh, and they had like a big opening, you know, season premiere party and I got to go. Um, the woman, Tracy, who's the HR person who they sort of modeled after me. Um, I never got to meet her, but I got to meet most of the cast and go to the set and it was just a fun experience, especially given that show was already so popular uh, amongst the tech community. Uh, it's like a kind of like a little bit of a living legacy in a way. And I had, I had no idea how many people actually like read the credits of TV shows, but, and they're, they're fast. I don't know how you see it, but people were like, I saw your name. Oh my gosh. Or one guy texted and was like, I just saw this whole thing where she was like taking down this engineer for being crazy. And he's like, you totally would have done that. So uh, at least according to a handful of people who knew this whole backstory, uh, they got they got it pretty right. It was just a fun. She's a comedian, so I take that with like a huge amount of pride uh, that they you know found a comedian to to do my role. And and actually, there's a lot about working with people that is funny. I mean, that's why that's why we watch TV about work. So uh, it was a really fun adventure. That is great. That is so true. So you're happy then with the portrayal of yeah, you I mean, and the this character. Didn't really. I mean, at the end of the day, I knew it was going to be fun TV and I never really worried about it. And it's been, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's been a super fun conversation starter. People see it on my LinkedIn and, uh, or people have heard like, Hey, I heard you were on Silicon Valley. And I'm like, well, I wasn't actually on Silicon Valley, but there's a character that is me on Silicon Valley, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So when it comes to managing people, clearly each company has a, a unique approach to that, but ultimately how are you helping guide the role in your case now with a you know an HR lens, but 
valuing the relationships and the people much more than perhaps the traditional approach to HR that didn't really interest you initially? Right. I think that's a great question um, because a lot of times people will talk about, it's, it, it's interesting to me because they talk about if I just have enough training, if I just have enough classes, I'll be a better manager. And what we found, it, or like what I found over the years, is a lot of times you actually pattern match what you've seen and experienced, and that's how you become a manager much more than sort of training and classes. And so I think it's really important that not just my role, but every leader that you have at the company is modeling the behavior as a manager. And so are they having clear conversations? Are they setting the right expectations? And are they making their employees feel valued? Which I think is really the context of the conversation we're hearing a lot over the last couple of years, which is people sort of recognizing for themselves what's important. And then finally articulating it either by you know, expressing that to their managers and asking for something, maybe sometimes for the first time, um, or just by leaving and going somewhere else and, and looking for it in that way. How does one execute this people first strategy to make people feel valued and get them to stick around? Right. I, I, I think it starts with trust, frankly, when trust starts at the very beginning of the conversation, even when you're in the recruiting conversation, are you uh, when you're talking to somebody about joining your company, are you being honest about what the expectations are for the role, about what your company is about, about how people get promoted, about their compensation? Where did their compensation come from? How are you getting to that number? What's the path for compensation? Like all of those things start at the very beginning. And I, you know, I actually talk about the like, the first day is so meaningful because if you screw up someone's first day, they kind of never forget that and, and sort of hold it against you. So you don't want to screw up anybody's pay. You don't want to screw up the, you know, sort of benefit system. You don't want to set up not having a, you know, having a computer ready for them. Like that's such an important moment for people because it's trust. You're building trust. Someone's taken a risk and a leap of faith and you want to build that foundation. And then I think if you're a manager, it's, you know, keeping that trust bank high. So when there are mistakes or you're going to screw up or things are going to happen, there's enough there that, you know, you're still, you're not running on empty um, as you're, you're sort of going through your journey with an employee. And, and so trust is usually built by not just what you say, but, but actually acting on the things that you say. So, you know, I, I say, Hey, with my team, I don't feel like I have to we don't do performance reviews at companies that I'm with, for example. I don't think that that's a very effective way. Like the idea of like once or twice a year, you're going to sit down and say like, here's how you're doing. And this is what I think. We implemented a weekly system, uh, a tool. So it's weekly feedback and you're giving it ongoing. And then that way, no one is ever surprised. I don't feel like the rug's getting pulled out from under them. It makes it a lot easier to identify very specific things that somebody can do to be better. Um, I've been really influenced the last few years about this idea that um, we spend so much time working on the things that we're not good at. And instead, why aren't we working on the things that we're strong at and just get better at our strengths? And so I've really been trying to talk more and more um, with my leaders about how do you lean into your employees where they're strong and where their strengths are? And instead of like nitpicking on all of the little things, now certainly work quality is important and you need people to, to turn things around in the way that you're asking them. Um, but what you wanna do is make those people feel confident and respected and then that trust will continue. You'll have earned that trust over time. So when things are rocky and change happens and things like a global pandemic happens or your revenue cuts in half, that you've built this level of trust and authenticity um, that people are going to, to stick with you over time, or they'll be honest with you about why they don't want to stick with you and what's important to them um, and creating that space. So we have my current company at Credit Karma. You know, when I first got there, we use heavily Slack in, internally as our internal chat. And um, I created an Ask Colleen channel so people could ask me whatever they want. And I would answer as long as it wasn't somebody's like personal information or or something that was truly a confidential situation. I just sort of laid it out there. This is this is how we pick your pay. This is how we do it. This is how it works. This is all the systems like 
you know, and I'm just very matter of fact, I'm not emotional about it. I just like, Hey, this is, this is it. And so, you know, we've built this comfort with people that they can ask our leaders anything they want with their name on it, not in some anonymous forum. And nothing will happen to them. In fact, I've made it very clear that I respect, I have a way deeper respect for someone who asks a hard question and is willing to be transparent with their own name on it versus people who do it in some sort of anonymous, fearful sort of way. And I said, look, you're asking us as leaders to be as transparent with you as possible about what's going on with the business, how we're making decisions, the context of those things. Uh, Now I'm asking you as an adult who is working for us to give us the same level of trust um, and it really helped us. And, you know, this is a bit of a long answer, but uh, Credit Karma in 2020, uh, right when the pandemic hit, we had just announced that we were gonna be acquired. We went through a, we knew we were gonna go through a very long Department of Justice review of that acquisition. It was almost 10 months actually. Um, and we were always an in-person culture. So we were not a go work from home. It's totally cool. That was just not who we were. And so all of a sudden, you know, for safety reasons, we send everybody home due to COVID and, um, and then our revenue dropped by about 75%, uh, because the credit markets markets tightened, which is where our source of revenue were coming from our partners. And, you know, and everybody knew it because we were very public with our dashboards about our revenue and our partner situation. And then we had a lot of fear. I mean, talk about uncertainty for people. And I think your job as a leader is to provide certainty when possible. And so we said, hey, by this date, we're going to announce what we're going to need to do to stabilize the company. Um, We're going to have a whole list of actions like and and we're going to commit to that. So, you know, it took us about four weeks to kind of figure it all out. And um, we were able to you know, advocate to the board that we didn't want to do any layoffs. That just was not who we were. We weren't going to take away people's jobs. Uh, so we said, hey, we're going to do pay cuts. That's that's the way we're going to do it. We're all going to be in this together. Um, we shut down recruiting. We shut down paid marketing. And we moved all of those people into other jobs in the company. Um, and then we told people, look, if this isn't for you, if this is not the journey you want to be on, that this ambiguity and uncertainty is too much for you, we will pay you to leave right now. Like, don't just drag it out. Just, you know, we called it the off the bus package. You can just get off the bus now. We'll, you know, give you some extra money uh, and give you some extra equity and those kinds of things and leave. And then, you know, we gave monthly updates as to how we were doing towards what we needed to get back to. And then by October, we were able to to bring payback. And then we were able to, you know, we closed this deal in terms of the acquisition. And then we've had six quarters in a row that have been record breaking quarters for us as a business. Um, after that. So, but the trust we built over, you know, sort of before that in relationships and then by the transparency and the authenticity, um, it really carried us through on that journey. We only had, we had about 1300 people working for us when we did all of the pay cuts and that type of thing. And we only had 11 people who opted off the bus at the time. And, you know, in very, you know, easy markets to find another job, San Francisco, Los Angeles, London, like, you know, I think a lot of people were very invested um, in that trust is what people still come back to that they really believed um, that we were going to take care of them and that we meant what we said. I love that. And I appreciate your transparency about the story of how that trust is even more Imperative, obviously, when you're taking a you know 75% hit to revenue. So that's a great example of how you guys navigated that and, and clearly were successful in the end. 